days to get this ship ready to sail. Then we'll send Hitler a telegram saying the Torin's ready, you can start your war. I began my career as a very bad accountant. And uh, I really hated it. It was very dreary working in the city of London. And uh, I finally got a job as a tea boy to the camera department in the silent days. And uh, it was a very different kettle of fish from now. Um, we worked in a glass studio, like a huge conservatory because uh, the lights weren't very good, and so we made every use we could of the daylight. I first met David in about 1934. We were working in the same studio. I was a casting director. He was a, an editor working with an American editor, uh, um, an American editor from whom he said he learned all that there is to be learned about editing. In those days, the director, as some of them do now, always cut his own films. and. Uh, he, had, he couldn't cut this film without um, being told how to synchronize film. So the, the only person in the studio who knew how to synchronize film was the uh, editor of the Sound News, the newsreel. And uh, he could spare two hours. Now, I hitched myself on as the director's assistant. And in the two hours, I'm very glad to say, the uh, director didn't cotton on to how to synchronize sound, and I did. He always pays the most generous tributes to this man with whom we first started, the first American he started working with. And towards the end of the 30s, uh, he became unquestionably the best editor that we had in England at the time, and I should think probably one of the best there was anywhere. I became fascinated by it. I still think it's a kind of magic sitting here and juxtaposing images. It's a wonderful job, most interesting the whole lot. Noel Card, who I'd known for some years, was approached by the head of the company with which I was then working to ask if he would make a film for the war effort. And his first reply was no, and then he happened to have dinner with his friend, Lord Mountbatten, who told him the story of the destroyer, Kelly. And from that was born the film in which we served. In which we served was the first film I ever directed, or rather, co-directed. And uh, I was rather young, and I was very frightened. And I mostly remember it because I always wondered if the doorman would let me into the studio. No left practically all of it to David, and certainly all the action stuff was done entirely by David, and brilliantly done, and brilliantly worked out beforehand. By the time we'd been shooting for about four weeks, he abandoned direction more or less altogether, except for telling David how the lines should be said, in his opinion, what the intentions behind the scenes were. Now for our program. You've most of you seen the commissioning program of the Torin published in Plymouth General Orders. And you will have noted that this allows the customary three weeks. Well, you've all read your papers, and you know that Ribbentrop signed a non-aggression pact with Stalin yesterday. As I see it, that means war next week. And so I will give you not three weeks, but exactly three days to get this ship ready to sail. None of us will turn in or take our clothes off or sling our hammocks for the next three days and nights till the job's finished. Then we'll send Hitler a telegram saying the Torin's ready, you can start your war. The first time I saw Brief Encounter in a theater 
was while we were on location making great expectations, it was a place called Rochester, which was a rather rough neighborhood. And uh, in the first love scene, a lady in the audience started to laugh. Nobody took much notice. And in the second love scene, she laughed more. In the third love scene, it became worse and worse, and it proved completely contagious until the whole audience was collapsed in laughter. And I remember going home at night, lying in my bed and thinking, how can I get into the laboratory and burn the negative? I was so ashamed of it. There's your train. Yes. You mustn't miss it. No. What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing at all, really. It's been so very nice. I've enjoyed my afternoon enormously. I'm so glad. So have I. I apologize for boring you with long medical words. I feel dull and stupid not to be able to understand more. Shall I see you again? It's the other platform, isn't it? You have to run. Don't bother about me. It might not do for a few minutes. Shall I see you again? Yes, of course. Perhaps you'll come out to catch us one Sunday. It's rather far, I know, but we should be delighted. Please. Please. What is it? Next Thursday. The same time. No, I couldn't possibly. Please. I ask you, most humbly. You miss your train. All right. Run. Goodbye. I'll be there. Thank you, my dear. Great Expectations was my first Dickens film, and after it had been shown, all sorts of people thought I was a Dickens expert, but in fact, I'd only read Christmas Carol. And I suppose that's why, in a way, in those days, I don't know what it's like now, it came off, because I didn't know anything about Dickens. When I read the book, it excited me, and I just tried to put on the screen what had excited me from the page. Who is it? Pitman. Pip? Mr. Pomachuch boy. Come to play. Come nearer. Let me look at you. Come close. Look at me. You're not afraid of a woman who has never seen the sun since you were born. No. Do you know what I touch? Here? Your heart. Broken. I always felt rather guilty about Oliver Twist because Noel Coward once said to me, always come out of another hole. And uh, we did it as soon as we'd done Great Expectations, merely because we couldn't find another hole to come out of. The greatest surprise it had was that it went very well in England, but when it went to the States was a tremendous hoo-ha about the character of Fagin. Because they thought that the film was anti-Jewish. Now, I had not no such thought in my mind. And unfortunately, they, after about two or three years, they finally cut it. And they cut out all the humorous parts of Fagin. And in my opinion, the American version is anti-Semitic. Very glad to see you, Ivor. Very. Aren't we, my dears? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Dear, how far have you come? I've been walking for seven days. Walking for seven days? Beak's yeah. all right. Do you know what a beak is, my dear? A bird's master. <laughs> Sit down, all of you. A beak is a magistrate, my dear. Don't you take off the sausages. Sit down, either. There are a great many of them, ain't there, my dear? Yes. You just looked them out ready for the wash. <laughs> I hope you've been at work, Dodger. Oh, I got the idea of Sound Barrier through reading a paragraph in an English paper. 
It said that uh, Geoffrey de Havilland had been killed because his plane had broken up over the Thames right, estuary. And they guessed that possibly he'd been exceeding the speed of sound, and in so doing, he'd hit some sort of wall. So we made a film about this wall. Nine five. Summertime was a great moment for me because it was the first time I'd met and worked with Catherine Hepburn. I think she's the greatest actress I've ever worked with. I've never known anyone who combines a complete mastery of technique with real gift. And this, of course, was her film. Okay, shoot. Look, come here, come here. Be a good boy, stand over there, and don't move, and shut up. Go ahead, now, stop. Okay. Mom, mommy. saying I'm proud of all of you but we are facing a crisis and for those of you who feel up to it how about lending the others a hand eh fetch and carry a spot of paint here and there what do you say yes good show come on follow me River Kwai was the film that really started me off in my love affair with uh, strange and rather exotic locations. And it was also the film that got me my first Oscar. Lawrence of Arabia was very lucky for me because uh, it was on that picture that I started working with Robert Bolt. It was his first screenplay. And there was another thing. It also gave me the most exciting year, if not the hardest I've ever had in my life, because I lived in the desert for over a year. Good morning, sir. Salute! If you're insubordinate of me, Lawrence, I shall put you under arrest. It's my manner, sir. Your what? My manner, sir. It looks insubordinate, but it isn't really. Well, I can't make out whether you're bloody bad-mannered or just half-witted. I have the same problem, sir. Shut up. Yes, sir. Now, the Arab Bureau seem to think you would be of some use to them in Arabia. Why, I can't imagine. You don't seem able to perform your present duties properly. 
I cannot fiddle, but I can make a great state from a little city. What? Thermistocles, sir, a Greek philosopher. I know you've been well educated, Lawrence. It says so in your dossier. You're the kind of creature I can't stand, Lawrence. But I suppose I could be wrong. All right, Dryden, you can have him for six weeks. Who knows? Might even make a man of him. Come in. Dr. Zhivago is the film that gave me my first real battering from the critics. It uh, opened in New York. And then it went to London, where I hoped they'd be a little kinder, but they weren't. They were worse than New York. And uh, then to Germany, where they were worse still. In fact, by the time it had finished, I, at one horrible moment that I'm rather ashamed of, I thought I'd better retire. But then the money started pouring in. And uh, it made more, made more money than all the other films I'd made put together. You know, you often look at me as though you knew me. I have seen you. Four years ago, Christmas Eve. Were you there? No wonder you look at me. Did you know Viktor Komarovsky? Yes, I did. That young man who took you away. My husband. Not of courage. He made the rest of us look very feeble. As a matter of fact, I thought you both did. Good man to shoot at. I'd give anything never to have met him. Ryan's daughter is, in a way, an outcome of Lawrence and Zhivago, because on both those pictures, Robert Bolt and I were saddled by the enormous weight of a book. And so we said, why not let's try an original? And so we did. It was also one of the toughest pictures I've had to make from a physical point of view. This girl, Ryan's daughter, rather reminds me of a conversation I had with an Indian friend of mine. And we were talking about romantic or arranged marriages. And he was a very intelligent, very modern-minded man. And he said something which me made me say to him, uh, tell me, Krishna, what side do you come down on? And he said, I think I come down on the side of arranged marriage, if anything. I said, why? He said, because with a romantic marriage, you expect heaven. Heaven does not exist. And so therefore, you are bound for disappointment. While in an arranged marriage, you expect nothing. And if you get something, you think you are extremely, extremely lucky. You'd never be unfaithful to me, would you? <sighs> I'm sorry I shouldn't have asked that. No, no, that's a rotten question for a man to ask his wife. When Robert and I started this script, we wondered where to place the story, because we wanted to make a very ordinary, simple love story, or a film about love, let's put it that way. And in my opinion, the script is the most important thing in a whole film. If you haven't got a good script, you can't make a good film. When, for instance, I worked with Robert Boat, I said that the person I wanted most to please was the writer. He didn't believe me then, but he does now. I have an enormous respect for the writer, because he's the man who gives the actors their words, he gives them their characters, 
He gives them really everything. And he also gives me what I have to interpret from the visual point of view. Uh, when I'm writing a script uh, for David, I write it with David. That is to say, we live in the same building for a year. And we work at it day by day. When we've finished writing the script, when Robert's finished writing it down, I go off by myself with a typewriter and I start page one, scene one. And I will write, close up so-and-so, 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 so-and-so. Two, medium shot. So-and-so sits down at a table and does this. And I'm sitting there at the typewriter. I'm trying to visualize pictures that will slot together and look as if they're a continuous movement. It is awfully difficult to compare directors. Everybody has his own stamp of individuality. And everybody uh, directs pictures his own way. Uh, the one distinguishing quality for David is that when you prepare a script with any one of those other excellent and very competent directors, uh, you kind of expect that at best you'll get on the screen the transposition of your script just the way you expected it when it's very good, sometimes a little less. With David there is always invariably an element of added surprise. He always brings something added to what the script called for, whether it is in um, um, photographic setups or whether it is in surprise cutting uh, notions that occur as he shoots the picture. David, you see, puts three years into a film. A year with me on the script, a year shooting, a year cutting and dubbing. Uh, this is not because he's a leisurely worker at all. He works like a coal miner, literally seven days a week, literally 12 hours a day. My idea, when we've finished writing a script and we do spend a long time over it, is to get what we've written on the screen. And if I can avoid it, I won't change a line of dialogue and I keep in every intention that we had in that script. That's my job. I'm trying to get the actors to be the characters in the script. That is my only guideline. And uh, so I'm very, very wary about changes. I'm very, very wary about improvisation because it leads one, if one's telling a story, it generally leads one off onto side tracks. And uh, I think they can be very dangerous. Take 11, take one. All right, dear, when you like. If you could see how hard we have been working here, I know you would forgive me, dear, for not writing more regularly. When was that written? July the 20th. Eight weeks. But now the war seems really to have stopped. The hospital is emptying and I shall have more time. I may even get time to write some verse. I don't really believe in the <laughs> screen tests. Because you set somebody in front of a camera, they're on trial. They are generally given a scene that they have to play with an unimportant actor, because you're not going to get uh, important or good actors coming along and wasting their time on an unknown person. And I think it's terribly unfair. If you, um, if in, I have done it from time to time, and if somebody is 25% good, you can automatically say they'll jump up to 75 when they're in the actual film. Yuri? It's awfully early, isn't it? Half past six. What are you doing? Nothing. Couldn't sleep. Is anything the matter? No. Shall I get some tea? <laughs> yes, do. But I don't I don't think it's a very good idea. I think you'll have to work on hunches. 
I like meeting people, talking to them. I have an idea of the character, a very strong idea of the character I want them to play, and I think, I wonder if you could do this, and I ask them a few questions, and if they seem, as it were, simpatico, with the type of character I have in mind, I generally take a plunge and go for them. Perhaps you are not aware that the bridge is now under my personal command. Really? May I ask, are you satisfied with the work? I am not. You've proved my point. I hate the British. You are defeated, but you have no shame. You are stubborn, but have no pride. You endure, but you have no courage. I hate the British. Actors are very restless people on the whole. And the poor actor is told, right, well, see you in four days time and he's rather like a puppet sent back put on the shelf and i suppose that accounts for it a lot they get very excited by their work which i understand very well it's a kind of drug they go up to a high pitch in a scene they do a couple of days work on it and you say you've done wonderfully and if they have been good they they damn well know it and they go away high if i've done something which i think has come off I'm quite high in the evening. Almost. I suppose I'm a kind of a nut in a way. The most important thing in my life is my work. I love getting near a camera and a camera crew. And uh, I, I like doing films in rather wild places. I find wild places exciting. I think it's marvelous. And I like showing things on the screen that people in the normal way don't see. Starting the summertime, I saw Venice. We had to shoot in St. Mark's Square, and the shopkeepers all say, do you realize you're ruining our business? How much will you pay us? We are losing this and that. And uh, one's at the mercy of the inhabitants. After that, I went to Ceylon for River Kwai. Spent nearly a year there. Marvelous scenery. And after that, I went to the deserts of Jordan and Morocco. Some of the most stupendous days I've ever had in my life. And I've got this bug of making movies outside, mostly because traveling excites me. And it's really like a continual cruise through life. I'll never, except when I'm very old, go back to that dark hole and return to the studio. Costumes are always a problem. The actual detailed work, I think, is not all that difficult because you can go into museums and libraries and you can copy styles. Of course, it needs real flair to give that extra something about a costume. One of the most difficult things about doing costumes for a picture is making them look as if they really belong to the actors. A lot of the people in the wardrobe department spend hours with pumice stone, razor blades and knives wearing down materials at the elbow, putting in leather patches, and gradually they begin to look used. But it's a very, very difficult thing to achieve. As Alexander Porter said to me once about a certain director, he's a bloody fool, 
He thinks he only has to direct the actors. And of course, as far as one can, one has to direct everybody's job. That is, give them help. The art director, for instance, we've got to talk together for hours. He does a lot of drawings. And uh, we discuss the sort of set it should be, the sort of atmosphere we want to create. The advantage of building sets, as opposed to using real places, is that it's much cheaper. We built a Moscow street in Spain for Zhivago. Now, the alternative would have been to go to Moscow. If we'd been allowed in Moscow, which we would not have been, it would have been almost impossible to work in a Moscow street. I mean, I've tried it. I've tried it in Venice, but it costs a fortune. But in the case of Ran's daughter, we wanted very much to give the idea of a very isolated community. So we built a village in a desolate part of the west coast, which was surrounded by hills without another building in sight. And I think it achieved what we were after. It's a cheap thing to build sets. We've got the people there, they're paid anyhow, and one only has to pay for the materials. And that, compared with the disadvantage of, disadvantage of shooting in real places, is enormous. Working with crowds can vary. Actually, I prefer working with amateurs. Bedouin in the desert, although most of them have never been to a movie, got the hang of the thing pretty quickly. And uh, we explained through interpreters what they were supposed to be recreating. And they did it very, very well. In fact, an amusing sideline on this is that uh, when we had a whole string of camels and riders at a distance where they couldn't hear us yelling for them to start, we used to fire a very pistol into the air which would go off with a loud bang. And after about a couple of weeks, the camels all started on the first bang. And for the signal to stop, we used to fire two bangs and the camels automatically stopped on the two bangs. In Ireland, we had a lot of extras from the very tough districts of Tralee. And the Irish are very natural actors. We used to explain the scene to them. I don't believe in not explaining scenes to crowds. The trouble is the same with ordinary actors. You've got to get them simmering and make the first take when they come to the boil. It generally runs down after that. The spontaneity goes. How dangerous is it going to be? I've been very bewildered Exploring by this question of sex and the permissiveness on the screen. And I've tried to keep my feet on the ground. I think it's a wonderful thing that we've got more freedom. I mean, not long ago, we couldn't have a married couple in the same bed. We used to have, to have twin beds. And I think it's marvelous that that's broken down. And I'm not, as it were, alarmed by it at all. I understand very well what's happened and that the whole thing started in England is no accident, I think, where we had this rigid control, this rigid Puritanism. And it's no wonder that that is where swinging London got its name and why it got its name. Because it was so rigid. I mean, I know, I was brought up a Quaker. And uh, when I was young, I wasn't even allowed to go to the cinema. 
because it was a wicked place. It also poses a terrible question for a director because of uh, the type of love scene he shows. If you're with it, you show everything. If you're an old hat, you evade. And it's frightfully hard to um, strike a balance. I think one's just got to say, what does the story need? It's very difficult to show sexual love because the body is just an instrument. It's a light to one's imagination, surely. And that's a tough one to show on the screen. It is impossible to make a really well-made picture without spending money. It's not a question of wasting money, but the, to get optimum results takes time, and nothing is more expensive in films than time. And David is a man who is a perfectionist, and if he's making a film, he wants to get as near to 100% of what he visualized from the script as he possibly can. David is a perfectionist, and he, he wants everything uh, exactly the way he uh, visualizes it. And you can't do this on a shoestring. You've got to have all the equipment with you. The realism that you get from uh, shooting a picture on location is very, very important, as opposed to the old-fashioned way of, of, uh, that we used to do years ago, shooting everything in a studio. And usually with David Lean, uh, David Lean sort of pictures, you nearly always get spring, summer, autumn, winter. So that you try doing the summer to get your summer scenes, and then you know that later on you're going to get your autumn scenes, and then your winter scenes, and so on. This makes for a realistic atmosphere to the whole picture. When one becomes a professional, the very fact that one's been given a lot of money to make a film with is automatically, as it were, a dirty word. Money's a dirty word nowadays. I don't know why it should be. I don't think the public have this attitude at all. I think if they go into the theatre and they start to be gripped by what's up on the screen, they don't give a damn if it cost nothing as it were, or it costs a lot. If they're involved and they are excited by the images they see, all that goes out of the window and they will go. I've spent um, months working with a great big traveling circus. Uh, have actors, technicians, people who can work hoses and wind machines. And we have thousands of vehicles and we chase all over the country. And it, it, I always say that we're one of the last of the traveling circuses. At the end of it all, here I am in a very, very small room. And the whole thing is just on that, mm -hmm. and it's wonderful. Peace and quiet. When I make a film, I can't help seeing it as a cutter sees it. And um, every scene that's played, although I'm standing by the side of the camera and not looking through it, 
I think I see it oblong. In a curious way, I've got so used to the shape that I can put oblongs around a person. And I also, although we are sitting on a set with live people, I see it as the picture that I'm seeing in here now. And I think, yes, that's very good. That's all right. Oh, no, that's a pity. But I can cut to a close-up, which I'm about to take there, and come back to you there. And uh, I try to shoot with the cutting room in mind. Of course, I make many, many mistakes. I don't think anybody can pre-cut a film. I start from the beginning. I try not to ha have any cutting done while I'm shooting it, because if I wait till the end of the picture, there's a marvellous excitement starting at reel one with a whole load of film and uh, telling a story in pictures. In fact, very often I can't wait to grab the next bit of film to see if that long shot cuts onto that close-up. It's very exciting. and heard audience saying, oh, wasn't it wonderful photography? And I've sort of walked along beside them, eavesdropping. And very often, they're not referring to photography at all. They're referring to cutting. As a cutter, you decide what an audience shall look at when. And this is a very fascinating business. Please, sir, I want some more. What? 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 Ask for more? This is one of the reasons why, of course, theatre people object to films. They say you can make dogs and children act. <laughs> to a point you can, but you can't really cheat a great performance. This is rank mutiny. <laughs> and that is that wherever she goes, there is always in her life a permanent and undefeated rival, her husband's ship. Whether it be a battleship or a sloop, a submarine or a destroyer, it holds first place in his heart. It comes before wife, home, children, everything. Some of us try to fight this and get badly mauled in the process. Others, like myself, resign themselves to the inevitable. That is what you will have to do, my poor Marine. That is what we all have to do if we want any peace of mind at all. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you my rival. It's extraordinary that anyone could be so fond and so proud of their most implacable enemy. This ship. God bless this ship and all who sail in her. I was very frightened of a scene we had in which a whole group of dragoons charge a pr procession. I was frightened of it because I've seen so many horsemen charging people and the sword comes, swords come out. You have close-ups of the sword being lifted and a close-up of a man with his head being split open falling down the street and it's bong, 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 bong and it's a kind of bore. And I got the idea of not showing any of it at all. So what I did was this, I had the um, dragoons charge down the street. The people start to run. Little incidentals of the running, such as a drum rolling down the street. And then at the moment that the clash came, I cut to a big close-up of Omar Sharif. And I stayed on him, hearing the yells and the cries 
off stage. I held it for quite a long time and then cut back to the street and there were the bodies lying there. Thank goodness it, I think, worked. But uh, if it hadn't worked, I'd have been cooked because I didn't shoot any of that sabre bashing. As far as music's concerned, I always think of it as soon as we start writing the scenes. Very often, visuals will carry a complete point. And I like long, silent sequences where people don't talk. Now, sometimes this is very good with natural sound. And I'm always saying to sound editors, the people who do the soundtracks, don't be too natural with your sound. Use sounds as an orchestration to the picture. <coughs> Many is the time Music has saved me. I've made a mess of a scene. Or, in the case of an actress who should be soft, and if she is hard, what a little bit of soft music will do for her. I really use them as effects, I think. And on top of that, I like a good tune. To what extent a picture is commercially helped by music is really difficult to determine because one never knows how many people would have seen the picture without the help of the music. But one thing is definite that in some cases, the popular success of a musical tune in the record world and the television world and so on, it, it stimulates the attendance of the uh, cinemas to such an extent that you notice a visible and marked increase in, in, in attendance. And uh, that was true, for instance, in the picture that David Lean made, uh, Dr. Zhivago, which uh, it began extremely well, but not as well as it did once the music became uh, uh, much more popular. It helped us a great deal, I'm sure, with Bridge on the River Kwai. The tune, the whistling tune, has become a, an international su success, although it preceded our picture in its origin by uh, 40 years. When you're young, when you've got a small budget, when people are not really expecting much from you, and you make a halfway good film, the critics are very, very happy to give one a lifting hand. When one's got, when one's made a few successes, they begin to be suspicious of you. This applies also to actors. I remember saying to Julie Christie, after yes, she'd done Zhivago, I said, you're cooked. You're now real professional. And they'll start slapping you down. And this is what happens with many of us directors. The great thing, if you want critical approval, and you've read it many, many times, is to make a film on a shoestring, publicize it, and then have a distributor turn down the film altogether and show it to the critics. They will all come screaming for it to be shown. Now, I'm not talking about books, and I'm not talking, of course, about painting and that sort of thing, where the artist has a canvas or a blank piece of paper in front of him. But with movies, you are spending a fortune every day. And the distribution companies 
rather glory in saying the biggest ever, we spent a million dollars on this, or the insurance for so somebody's legs cost that. And by the time it comes on the screen, the critics are generally ready to say, all right, now show us. We'll crack you down. And they do crack you down. No doubt they'll sing in tune after the revolution. I think one of my great values, and I, I, always, I always think of this when I'm doing a scene, is it true? And that especially apply, applies nowadays. I think it's always applied, but it's more and more true today. Audiences, on the whole, I think have been way ahead of the film industry as a whole. The film industry is too often played down to audiences. And I think it's quite easy to make an exciting film, which is exciting for the moment, but when the audience go out of the theatre, they instinctively know that it was really basically a phony. And I think the audience is pretty damn smart. Well, I give in. I, I mean, I give up. Um, uh, Grazie. Prego. I will wrap it up. Uh, how? You will wrap it up. Wrap, uh, uh, wrap it up. Thank you. Will you be staying long in Venice, Signorina? Well, that depends on... I mean, I, um... It, it's... I feel as if I could stay forever. That is the fact Venice has. That is her child. By the way, if it were possible to get another goblet, would you wish still to have it? Oh, oh, yes, yes. I think it is just possible I may find one. Perhaps you could call again, or perhaps I could send it to your hotel. Where do you stay? In Venice. What? I mean, I'm, I'm living in the, in the um, Pensione Fiorini. Oh, yes, I do. Thank you. Well, we shall try and we shall hope. Thank you. May I? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Your glasses, Signorina. Did oh. you wear them or carry them? Carry them. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Being a director is a terribly lonely job because um, very often people don't quite know what you're aiming at and in a certain way one doesn't know oneself one's got a smell of what the scene could be one imagined that the one would set up the camera here look through it and there would be the shot that one imagined and you look through the camera and it isn't it at all then the trouble starts i generally send people off for tea and wander around rather miserably by myself. In fact, there was one occasion on Lawrence where I had that awful pressure which often comes on you. I had a thousand camels and a thousand horses all waiting, wondering what on earth was happening. I just couldn't get an angle on it. And I finally got it. But my goodness, they're lonely moments. I think one of the most difficult things about a director's job is that he's got to be a bit of a dreamer and dreamers don't generally go hand in hand with practical people and if you're going to be a director you've certainly got to be practical it's, it's not an airy fairy business at all it's a hard job of work like a carpenter <laughs>
I'm very old now. I've had, as it were, a kind of classical training in films. And uh, I find it hard, even at my age, to be able to make any great statements about life. And uh, so I, I try to tell a story about people, about life. But I just have to trust that what pleases me will please an audience, or what excites me will excite an audience. Of course, I can be terribly, terribly wrong. But if I start wondering what this person or that person will think of it, I, I'm lost. I can only please myself and hope to God that you people like it. I personally don't feel that I'm capable of making great statements. I think there are very few artists who are. There are people who are acclaimed as such, but uh, all right, give me Shakespeare or Beethoven or somebody like that. But we haven't produced anybody like that in the movies.